Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Nano Hub U again. This is Peter Bermel. And we're going to go through lecture 1 4, uh, which covers mainly the properties of 2D photonic crystals and a little bit on 3D photonic crystals as well. So if you recall from the previous lecture, 1.3, we talked about how to calculate photonic band structures. And in particular, we said that there's the so-called master equation, which you have right here, which uh, is effectively like the uh, Maxwell's version of the wave equation that accounts for the vectorial nature of light. And so it kind of looks like this. And it basically has two sets of operators in space, uh, this curl operator, and also has this epsilon inverse. And we said that solving this directly in the direct uh, spatial basis is really difficult, actually. But a much easier way to deal with the problem is to go into uh, reciprocal space, also known as like K space. And then in that case, we can actually write down uh, a solution in a matrix form where all of these curl operators get converted to something that looks like k plus g because there's an implicit e complex exponential in space and wave vector that goes like e to the i k plus g dot x. And then that gives rise uh, to this uh, equation which is taken directly from here. Uh, and then uh, you can see that you have individual elements of the H column vector, which kind of captures like the Fourier sum of all of the uh, total uh, magnetic fields that looks like that. And then that's uh, equated to uh, another element, HG, right? So in other words, uh, this epsilon G, G prime is what's connecting uh, different components of the magnetic field in Fourier space to one another. This kind of solution is already implemented numerically in MIT photonic bands. And so if you go to this website, then you can see how to use in more detail. Or also NanoHub itself has a MPB uh, version already implemented. So that saves you the trouble of compiling it. You can run it directly from your web browser. So uh, what kind of interesting properties do we have for the 2D and 3D photonic crystals that can be found using this technique. In particular, we find a lot of symmetry in these problems. And the symmetry ultimately is coming from uh, two sources. So there's both the uh, spatial symmetry, uh, which includes uh, kind of reflection symmetries and other mirror type symmetries, rotational symmetries, and then also periodic symmetries. And then the reflection symmetries and the rotational symmetries will help us reduce the computational burden somewhat. But the periodicity actually is the most fundamental because that's what allows us to work in this, in this case-based framework where we're representing H as a Fourier sum. If we didn't have periodicity, then we can't really do that as well. And that's what also gives rise to this Berlin zone. And another source of symmetry uh, that's important, but maybe not as obvious, is time reversal invariance. And so what that means essentially is that if you have a system which has no losses, which can be formally written in, in this way, that omega n k is equal to omega n minus k, then that tells you that uh, first of all, your operator is Hermitian or uh, lossless in some sense. And then therefore, if you run time forward or backwards, then you'll get the same results. However, if you have a non-Hermitian operator, which means that you have loss, then of course, running time forward or backwards will give you different results. Because in one case, something that looked like a loss medium will now look like a gain medium. So let me go a little more detail into the uh, mirror plane and rotational symmetries that I talked about earlier. So uh, as 
In the Joannopoulos textbook, you can see that mirror plane symmetry for 2D photonic crystals is defined with respect to uh, the Z plane, okay? And so that's where like X and Y vary and Z is held constant. And so uh, the first symmetry uh, where uh, H is the same as its uh, mirror image is usually called the TE mode. And then the one where uh, the mirror operator gives minus H is called the TM mode. And so what that means is that for every 2D system, you always have uh, two sets of modes, TE and TM, and they can be completely separated and treated distinctly. And then when you send light in, then you always have one or the other, either TE or TM light, or some superposition thereof. As for rotational symmetries, so those are usually defined so that when you rotate K, then you get the same omega N as before, or you can write it formally as omega N K equals omega N R K. And then this rotational operator R really depends on the point group in the crystallography of the system. Now in 2D, it's relatively simple because like the most common uh, lattices are oftentimes either square lattices, rectangular or triangular. And of course, it's very easy to determine like what kind of rotational symmetries will give you the original lattice in 2D. However, in 3D, it gets a little trickier. Um, so, I mean, roughly speaking in 2D, we can say that we have threefold, fourfold, and sixfold symmetries, which kind of makes sense because triangular lattices will kind of naturally give rise to both threefold and sixfold symmetries, depending on our, our basis or like kind of collection of elementary structures within one unit cell of our structure before it's repeated periodically. And then the fourfold symmetries are mainly coming from the square lattices. If we have another symmetry, like say a five-fold symmetry, then that actually formally speaking is not a periodic structure, but it starts to resemble what's called a Penrose tiling. Uh, kind of like what you'd get if you took a soccer ball and then flattened it out onto uh, a plane or a sheet of paper. And so that five-fold symmetry pattern uh, can be thought of as a quasi-crystal. Okay, so that's a related but slightly different topic. So now going to uh, the 2D photonic crystal, uh, you can see first of all that this structure is uh, periodic. You can see here it's basically an array of holes in some sort of high index substrate and that they're arranged in a triangular fashion. Uh, the unit cell basically consists of just a single of these uh, holes. And then that in turn, the presence of the periodicity gives rise to this uh, hexagonal Berlin zone. So this looks like kind of a six-fold symmetry. And then also the fact that if you rotate this like kind of in a three-fold or six-fold fashion, then you recover the original structure, allows us to reduce what was originally um, like uh, a six-fold structure to just like one of these panes. And then also if we can assume that it has time reversal symmetry, then we get to reduce it by another factor of two. And so then that gives us a total of factor of 12 reduction in the Berlin zone size in this little blue region. And then if we look at the band structure within that blue region, then you can see that uh, we get a, a photonic band gap both for TE and TM modes now, which is different than what we presented in the previous uh, slides or calculations. And so you might be wondering like, why is it that sometimes we're getting like a photonic band gap for both structures and then sometimes for uh, just one polarization and then maybe sometimes for no polarizations, okay? So this has been studied already and it's discussed in the Joannopoulos book. You can see here that there's a set of triangular lattice of air holes uh, and basically, if you choose uh, the parameters just right, then you can actually get into this yellow region where you combine uh, the TM band gaps that come from large radii holes and then the TE band gaps from small radii holes together into this yellow region. So you can see that there's a very specific set of band gaps. And then this is even called sometimes a band gap atlas, kind of mapping out uh, you know, what are the best designs uh, for a given target. So how can we understand this intuitively? So this kind of gives you some sense of what to look for 
Um, when you send light in from an angle, let's say, then you can kind of think of this almost like a Bragg type condition uh, where you see here that we have like kind of these yellow uh, arrays which kind of represent like kind of uh, reflection planes for light. And then we can construct uh, a periodicity in these reflection planes that's associated with the angle of incidence of the light. And then what that tells us actually is that we have like a new uh, lattice constant, uh, roughly speaking, that we call A2, which is kind of like the sum of the radius of the hole or the rod plus uh, the spacing to the next hole or rod. And then that A2 is going to be the key point at which you have like a definition of the edge of that Brillouin zone. And therefore, will also tell us where the frequency of the interaction is occurring. And it's written uh, analytically as being pi c divided by the average index value between the high and low dielectrics and uh, this A2 parameter that we just calculated. And so the reason why we have this uh, divided by n is because the speed of light is slower in a high index medium. So, uh, but if you ignore that, you could just write pi c divided by a c. And so then this is a very general concept that whenever you have like a periodicity, then the band gap usually occurs at pi times the speed of light divided by that spacing. Okay, so not just for 2D, but also 3D. And then this is just showing um, what happens uh, when you start to modify uh, some of these uh, spacings a little bit. So in particular, if you have like a very strong interaction and a large index contrast, then uh, that gives rise to like a larger off-diagonal matrix element, epsilon inverse GG prime. Okay, so then what you see here is that as you increase that index contrast, then you go from this regime in which you have like partial band gaps only at certain uh, frequency ranges and k vectors to something where it, the band gaps actually start to span a very large range. So no matter what angle you're coming at, then you still see these band gaps. And so then the overlap between the two gray regions from the two different A's is shown as yellow. And then that's like the yellow that you saw in the earlier diagram, which I showed here. Okay, so anyway, going back to the original presentation, what we see is that if we introduce uh, some additional complications to the 2D photonic crystals, then we can actually get even more interesting phenomena. And so one particularly interesting thing that we can introduce into a photonic crystal is a defect. And so you may say, why would we introduce a defect? Isn't that the problem? Well, so as uh, Professor Donopoulos once said, in photonic crystals, defects are a good thing because defects if carefully controlled, will allow you to create localized states that are uh, embedded within the range of band gap frequencies. While uh, like you have these modes that can propagate throughout the whole structure, they can exist at these specific locations. And so then that allows you to precisely control where and when uh, light will live within different regions of your photonic crystal. And so in this diagram, we're showing kind of three op objects that might be of interest. First of all, a point defect, or like the change in a single rod or hole in the structure. And so that'll give you like the most localized solution possible. Second of all, line defect, where you have a whole array shown in red of these uh, rods that are modified in some fashion, maybe by changing the dielectric constant, or uh, something that's kind of analogous, a surface mode, or like a, a kind of something similar to a surface plasmon mode, which is another hot topic in, it, in its own right, where the photonic crystal surface is modified and has like modes that are localized to the boundary uh, between the photonic crystal and then some other medium, which is maybe homogeneous medium, but not necessarily. And so here are a few examples of what happens in terms of the field profile when you start to remove uh, certain rods and create these defects.
So what you can see here in particular is that you can first of all give rise to a monopole-like mode, uh, which is like the most simple mode possible uh, if you completely remove the rod. But if you just make the rod a little smaller instead of removing entirely, then it gives rise to actually a different mode, which is called the dipole mode. And then also you can increase the size of the rod further and then get different quadrupole modes. Actually, like there are two that are degenerate in energy here and here. And then you give rise to a different monopole mode, uh, like at a similar radius. And then eventually you can get up to hexapoles or other dipoles. So you can see that actually there's a rich variety of, of localized modes that can uh, be created with a square lattice of rods or other photonic crystals of that type. And if you start from that uh, premise, then you can actually start to remove more and more rods in a line. Or not necessarily even in a straight line, you can also make them go around a curve. And so this uh, paper published in Nature in 97 showed that if you remove a series of rods and then uh, basically go straight and then kind of uh, like make a 90 degree turn, then you can actually get like 100% transmissive waveguide. Now it's not quite as simple as that because you also have to take into account possible back reflections in order to get full transmission. But uh, this principle is very general, so actually you can force light to travel in all kinds of directions and really uh, mold the flow of light using this technique. And so one a uh, particular application might be for uh, guiding light in very flexible substrates. But then, of course, you say, okay, well, the photonic crystals maybe are in a flat substrate or fixed substrate, so you can't do that. But there's a whole field now of photonic crystal-based fibers, uh, which include both these so-called holy fibers, which are uh, very analogous to this sort of structure, but made into a long drawn out fiber. And then there's also the so-called omni-guide. Uh, but, and both are basically capable of guiding light within a hollow core or empty region or even vacuum. So you can see here, like this blue or purple light basically is uh, being guided through uh, the hollow core of this waveguide. And this is actually a very remarkable result because most uh, dielectric waveguides uh, require you to guide in high index medium instead of a low index medium because of index guiding. And so this is kind of the opposite of what people are used to. So this can have some advantages, both in terms of detecting chemicals in air that might be dangerous, and that was turned into a product for uh, detecting uh, toxic chemicals or explosives. And then also it can be used uh, for uh, laser light surgery. Um, and you all think uh, at MIT has pioneered that approach in which a uh, flexible omni-guide can be directed into uh, patients who need to have certain uh, lesions removed from their trachea. So in the next class, uh, we're going to look at some more applications of these properties of the 2D and 3D photonic crystals and how these can be combined with index guiding in order to uh, achieve like some really interesting results. And uh, in order to prepare yourself, I'd recommend that you read Joe Chapter 8.